who's riding so late where winds blow wild? It's not the father grasping his child. It's a lonely horseman galloping through a chill summer night, wolves howling and owls hooting in the distance. He pauses for a moment, watching the medieval town that's slumbering deceptively calm in the distance and contemplates the horrors that await him. He bears up, rowels his horse and enters the godforsaken village. His quest is to rescue his princess. How original. Oh, and he looks like a living balloon animal. Welcome to Ecstatica, an unexpectedly cruel and sinister horror adventure that has, over time, faded a bit into video game obscurity, which makes it one of my favorite forgotten gems. I remember buying Ecstatica pretty much at the same time as the first Resident Evil. And although those games are set in completely different worlds, they felt surprisingly similar in how they played and especially felt. In retrospective, even though it came out two years prior and Resident Evil is considered the one to have coined the term, Ecstatica bears all the marks of a classic survival horror experience. It's controlled in the tradition of Alone in the Dark, which also served as a heavy influence for Resident Evil. The protagonist moves through pre-rendered backgrounds with fixed camera angles, often staged for dramatic effect in favor over perfect controllability. Reminiscent of cinematic games like Another World, its focus lies heavily on immersion. No heads-up display, no menus. We only have the items we carry in our left and right hand, and our health status is solely indicated through the way the character carries himself, limping in pain when we're close to death. What I didn't expect, especially from its rather comical, ellipsoid visual style, was how sinister and frightening it was. The seemingly quiet town is haunted by a horde of evil creatures that have pillaged, tortured, and massacred the town's population with sadistic ferocity. It's a wild pastiche of nightmarish fantasy monsters. Giant man-eating spiders, brutish minotaurs, an outright army of pesky goblin demons, undead skeletons, ghost warriors, guardian statues, an inspirited table come to life. And at the center of it all, the sadistic and cruel werewolf. He's one of the first villains we encounter and one of the main reasons that makes this game so terrifying. The werewolf is easily one of the strongest foes in the game, and he doesn't wait until the end when we're experienced and outfitted with good weapons. But he toys with us from the moment we enter the town, luring us into traps and torturing us just for the joy of it. Ecstatica draws its frightening atmosphere from its unforgiving pacing. Instead of easing you in with the hidden tutorial, teaching you its mechanics in a safe environment, it unleashes its most vicious enemies within the first minutes. And that immediately drives the point home that we're stranded in a truly menacing nightmare. We start out with no weapons, with lethal demons and insidious traps waiting around every corner, leading us through a gauntlet of deadly hazards. I remember being terrified and overwhelmed when I played it for the first time, and shocked by the unexpectedly graphic nature of the violence imposed on the innocent townsfolk depicted. And since the werewolf appears to be virtually invincible to our attacks, I spent dozens of tries trying to bury him in a furry of perfectly timed blows without taking damage myself. And after minutes of continuous beating, I actually managed to kill the fucker. And this was the point where the tide turned. Ecstatica has, just as a good survival horror game should, an inverted progression curve. Starting out with a severely underpowered player that has to overcome impossible odds in the beginning, but which are followed by a fast and gradual buildup of strength, courage, and familiarity should we stand through the initial onslaught. We find weapons and useful equipment, grind out breathing room to explore, and begin to understand the town a bit better. And before we know it, we venture forth into the heart of evil, entering the catacombs of the dark magician who is responsible for the abominable plague until we, the hero forged in flames, take him on and hopefully emerge victorious to ride home with our loved one. Ecstatica is not a long and also not a very deep game by any means, but it's a very honest and straightforward tale. It's strikingly memorable, elliptoid graphic style that was a workaround for the hardware limitations of the very early age of 3D graphics at the time made it a game that, sadly, few people have come across, but those who did remember it as one of those games that sticks to your memory like glue. 
It was developed by Andrew Spencer and published for MS-DOS in 1994 by Psygnosis, and it received critical praise at the time, and it sold apparently well enough that it was blessed with a sequel three years later. Because the story's not over, as when the hero returns to his home castle, he finds it ravaged by an even more vile army of hellish demons. Ecstatica 2 iterates and elaborates on the formula of its predecessor, keeping everything that made the original great and expanded it logically. A greater cast of unique and freakish monsters with a diverse range of attack patterns to learn and master, more weapons and equipment, and a more elaborate interface to manage your loadout, more intricate puzzles, more of that grotesquely out-of-place cartoon violence, and, first and foremost, an enormous medieval bastion that turns out to be a challenging and surprisingly Metroidvania-style playground for this dark and unforgiving survival horror adventure. Thinking about it, it actually managed to emit a very early version of Dark Souls flair, both in level design and scenery. Ecstatica and its sequel are not easy to obtain these days and generally considered abandoned wear. They run perfectly with DOSBox if you're interested in giving them a try. Though I don't know how their strangely unusual mix of angsty and also weirdly comical survival horror atmosphere holds up when you approach them unpreventably spoiled by two decades of video game evolution in between, but I hope that I could convey a tang of what made it memorable for me when I discovered it. This should be in a museum! I hope I could make it a little less of a forgotten gem. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little excursion into video game oblivion. Let me know if you want to see more forgotten gems in the future, and if you have any suggestions of intriguing titles that have fallen off the radar at some point. If you'd like to support my channel, then I'd be very grateful if you join my Patreon. And as always, my gratitude goes out to all the people who already support me there, with a special thanks to these top-tier supporters. Kelvin Bombach, Christopher Collish, Nicholas Stevenson, Ronnie Meinert, Ian Melancon, Dewey Wayu Hendrayani, Michelle Stoliker, Marissa Martinez, Carlos Vega, Milan Vujnovic, Thiago Pereira dos Santos Silva from Porto, Portugal, Dark Blue One, Caroline Mills, Danny Sendel, Luke Johnson, James Lynch, Evan Tekru, Travis Deng, and last but not least, Simon Anderson.